another edition of the Inside Scoop with InVideo. I'm Jeff C., and I'm excited. This is going to be another fun show with my good friend, Mike Alton, because he and I go way back to the old uh, Google Plus days, I think is when we connected. So it's been a while. Um, but uh, if you guys haven't, if you didn't, if you saw the show uh, yesterday, we are putting together a whole batch of podcasts. This is going to be a podcast. So we're putting a whole bunch of episodes to, uh, together. So that's why all the lives on the stream. But if you guys want to get notified when that podcast goes live, we're going to be going live with the whole whole bunch of podcasts uh the first part of february but you can oh, go to this right here bit.ly forward slash iv podcast and that'll uh hook you up with the bot and you can use uh leave your name and email address and that way you can get notified when uh we go live with the podcast because we'd really love to uh see you guys there and by the way we've got some of our friends in the audience we've got uh vaughn She's, oh my goodness, Jeff and Mike in one show. I know, it's amazing, and I'm dropping things. Things are falling over. Dogs and cats living together. Total anarchy. It's amazing. Thank you, Yvonne. Thank you so much. You're awesome. Appreciate that. But we're going to be talking all about blogging, and as we're going today, uh, before I hit the old uh, record on the podcast um, recorder here, I would love for you guys to sprinkle this out among the interwebs. Uh, and if you know somebody who's been wanting to start a blog or maybe they have a blog, but it's not doing really what they want, give them an app mention down below, call them into the conversation or the replay, let them know that we're doing this because as always, Mike is gonna give us a ton of good content. And uh, yeah, so, so excited to do this uh, for in video. So I'm gonna hit play, I mean record, not play, hit record on the old podcast uh, machine over here, and we will get started. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this episode of The Inside Scoop, where we're sitting down with one of the foremost blogging experts in the world, Mr. Mike Halton, a.k.a. The Blogging Brute. Now, I was going to ask you about this, Mike. Was it me who gave you that name, or was it Mia Voss? I can't remember. It was you. You <sighs> were the one that gave me... The, the nickname Blogging Brew, because we were doing your show, Manly Pinterest Tips, on yes. Google+, Plus, like you mentioned, the wild, wild west um, of live streaming back then. And we had done a show, either we interviewed Guy or maybe it was um, Gary Goldstein. I think it was Gary. Yeah. Producer, Pretty Woman. And while you and Stefan and, and uh, whoever else was on the show that day, I don't recall for sure, you guys were talking to Gary. I was taking notes. And, of course, I was you know, participating in the conversation. Right. And... Within moments, really, after we finished that broadcast, I had a blog post ready to publish and post. And you're like, dang, you're some kind of blogging brute to have done that. Oh, that's awesome. So I'm glad I have. I, now I take credit for it. Now, uh, I, w I was wondering yeah. about that, but I, I couldn't remember if it was me or Mia because she, she gave us all a bunch of nicknames numerous times. So uh, some of them were unprintable, but uh, we yeah, else. we will go that way. So. But let me introduce Mike. Mike, he is, if you haven't found out already, he is a award-winning blogger and the author at The Social Media Hat and The Blogging Brute and the brand evangelist at Agora Pulse. And he's been blogging for, oh my, for eternity now. And he's, uh, if you, you've seen him on the online space, I'm sure. But like he said, he can whip up a blog post in nobody's business. He's probably doing it right now. We used to tease him that he had another computer and he could do it with, with two hands at one time. So, um he can, he's he knows blogging back and forth and so um yeah so he's an incredible guy good friend of mine um he is very very giving so we're gonna have a, a lot of great questions for him of what it takes to write a blog post that can show up in google search results and actual actually drive traffic to his website but i wanted to he does have a new podcast as well and so Mike, can you tell us a little bit about that? I want to bring up your uh, URL for people who are interested, but tell them about this new marketing hy hyperdrive. Yeah, so this started as a newsletter uh, in Q4 of last year, 2020, and it, it was born from the idea that I needed to write more often to my subscribers in an actual letter format, you know, not less, a little less news, a lot more letters, as in Hanley would say. And so I did about 12 issues uh, in Q4. And so many people have been telling me over the years that I need a podcast, I need to do a podcast. And this finally gave me something to use as a podcast. So to be perfectly frank, my marketing hyperdrive podcast is me reading my newsletters. So if that sounds interesting to you, then by all means subscribe. If not, that's okay. But it's, it's a weekly newsletter and podcast that is sharing my thoughts 
on online marketing, social media marketing, relationship marketing, influencer marketing. So usually some kind of marketing spin, sometimes with a historical story to kind of tie it all up into something hopefully a little more interesting than me just telling you how to do something. Right. <laughs> well, it's so I don't I have you know, we get inundated by emails and there's only a couple that I read and Mike's is one of them. You know, you mentioned Ann Hanley before, but yours is one of them. So it, it really is good and you'll always learn something and he uh, does a great job. So if you're not into podcasts, make sure you subscribe to this newsletter and uh, you can find that on that website as well. I'm sure at uh, socialmediahat.com. Um, but uh, this, once again, I want you to remind you guys that I'm Jeff C. and you're listening to the Inside Scoop. And so, Mike, thanks so much once again for taking the time to meet with us today. So I'm going to dive right into some of the questions. So um, I want to ask you, like, for people today, let's, you know, who are starting to write a blog in 2021, um, what is what does it actually take to get your blog to show up on Google search? What is like the, the top things that you, you have to like, you know, check that off of your checklist of blogging that you have to do to be found? That's a great question. Cause there are quite a few things that can go into that to make your blog, what we would basically term success, successful. Mm -hmm. um, we are really talking about businesses and bloggers who are trying to create content where they want that to rank. And I say it that way because an e-commerce site that is just selling a bunch of widgets, this is probably not for you. You're going to want to just use ads to drive interested traffic to your content that way. But if you have a service-based business, if you have a higher-end product, or if you just want to blog because maybe you want ad revenue or something like that, this is what you want to do. You want to focus first on keyword research, which I think we'll probably spend a lot of time talking about what that mm -hmm. means. But basically making sure that there are actually people who are looking for what it is that you want to write about. We're talking about what it takes to rank in Google search, which means how do we make sure that we're found by the people who are searching for something like us, not us specifically, something like us. If you do a Google search on Mike Alton, I'm going to come up first. Guaranteed. <laughs> right. absolutely. But that was not hard. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm one of the few Mike Altons in the world. It was pretty easy to rank number one for my name. And it's going to be really easy for you to rank number one for your business name. So don't worry about ranking for your business name. What you want to think mm -hmm. about ranking for is something that people are searching for it's going to lead to a business result. So we'll talk about that in a minute. Now, you'll also want to spend time working on backlinks. And when I say time, I got to underscore that and bold it and make it all caps. <laughs> it takes time to get bank backlinks. And we'll talk about what that means, of course. And then finally, you're going to want to make sure that your blog overall is easy to digest. And by that, I mean... It's got to be easy to read. It's got to be interesting visually. And of course, it's got to be well-written. So there's a lot of things that go into just basically the overall look and feel and the content itself. So I, those are the top things for me, I think. But Mike, if, if, isn't, if my, my content's amazing, I mean, it's, it's like, you know, I know if I build it, they will come. Is, is, that, a, is that a myth? Like, do I need, can't can I just write great content? I mean, my mom... And, you know, all my family thinks it's amazing. I should write a book. So if I should, not I just publish it and it would just, it would just show up. Yes and no. Um, there's certainly some, some truth to the idea that if you build it, they will come. Uh, it, we're obviously referencing and, and kind of mocking the field of dreams line. And it's a common, I don't know, cautionary tale right. in online marketing that it's not true with online marketing. If you build it, they're not going to come. They're not going to just come because you built it because nobody can see it. It's not something physical that people will drive by, right? Like a stadium. If you build a stadium in the middle of downtown St. Louis, where I live, people will see it. People will know that a soccer team has moved to downtown St. Louis without you ever having to advertise. That's not true in the digital space. But if you do technically create the most amazing content ever and you do some technical things right like you it's it's on a public html page that's indexable by search engines there's some technical stuff in there mm -hmm. then technically speaking google could find it and google could send people to you but there's some ifs there and so what we're going to talk about today are ways that you can make sure that that happens that you can actually very deliberately put your content in a place 
in a way that Google will find it, Google will search it, and Google will understand what it is that you're talking about, and at the same time realize that you are, in fact, an expert in this particular topic and that other people really should read your work. Awesome. So let's let's break down those things that you mentioned, you know, what, what you really have to have to get started. Uh, like, so let's talk about this first one. Let's talk about keyword research. So first of all, what is that? If you, you're brand new to this, it sounds like keyword, what is he doing? And research, that means I have to go find stuff and, and figure it out. What do you mean by uh, keyword research and, and why is it so important? Yeah, this is homework. I'm, I'm telling you right <laughs> now, you're going back to school, you're doing homework. And I say that in jest, but of course, I'm 100% honest. And if we think about it from a business perspective, most startups today would look to Eric Reese's book, The Lean Startup, as a good model to follow when it comes to starting a new business. And with The Lean Startup, what you're doing is creating an MVP, a minimum viable product, and a way to communicate and test your idea for a business with a target audience to see if it's actually going to be of interest. People would pay for whatever it is your idea for your business might be. And so you, you create maybe a mock-up product maybe it's a mock-up website and then you go and you actually talk to focus groups mm -hmm. and you find out would you would you buy this would you use this if you were to use this particular thing whatever that thing is what would it do for you that's research and it's come to be found that it's necessary if you want to be successful with your business and not just rely on luck because we don't know in our own brain whether or not for sure other people are going to want to buy from us well it's the same thing with content we don't know in our own brains how many people per month are searching on a particular keyword. We don't have access to that data unless we use a tool, unless we take the time to look it up. Because you might be surprised to find that nobody <laughs> is searching for what you thought you were going to write about. Or the opposite, you might find that there are tens of thousands of people who want to know what it is that you have in your brain that you could write in, in a series of blog posts and share. So I, I use the fun example of box turtles all the time. And if you were doing a startup blog and business on box turtles, maybe you want to teach people how to care for box turtles right. and how to buy the right equipment. And you want to use your Amazon affiliate links, you know, to sell, you know, cages and food and all that kind of thing. That's great. How many people are actually searching for box turtle information per month? I don't know. Mm. Right. Maybe it's only 10 or 15 people every month are actually going to Google and typing in, how do I care for box turtles? What do I feed box turtles? Other kinds of phrases that they would possibly plug in. That phrase is what we refer to as the keyword. Now, keyword is a terrible label because right. it actually applies to multiple words. You just, you're not going to rank for one word. That's just not possible in today's age of internet because there's just so many results out there. Mm -hmm. So you want to look for phrases of two, three, maybe four or five keywords. We call that a long tail keyword phrase where it's like four or five words. Right. Somebody's probably putting in an entire question, an entire sentence at this point at five words. That's a keyword. And you use a tool like SEM Rush to type in your ideas for what people might be searching for how to care for box turtles, what to feed box turtles, how to make a box turtle happy. I don't know. <laughs> and you plug those things in and the tool will tell you, Mike, there's only a hundred people a month mm -hmm. looking for that particular phrase. Now, maybe for your business, 100 results per or 100 you know, searchers per month is actually okay. If you're selling a high dollar ticket item, right? Like maybe you're selling a consulting package that's worth $2,000. You only need to make a few sales a month to, you know, earn enough revenue for your right. business. So a hundred or so visitors might Would be, be okay. But if, you're, if your business model is affiliate links to Amazon, where you're going to earn a small commission on a relatively low dollar amount item, a hundred a month isn't going to cut it. You need thousands and thousands and thousands. Now you can stack them. And by that, I mean, you might see a hundred people a month searching for how to feed box turtles and another hundred or 200 people a month searching for where to buy box turtles, right? right? And you can start to target a lot of these different keyword phrases and stack them together and create a body of work that in some will bring in thousands of people per month. 
This is the kind of research that you need to do. And it, it takes some time. I mean, this is, this is not going to be a so, couple seconds and we're done kind of a deal. So what if, let's say I decided, you know, my passion is underwater basket weaving, whatever. And so I'm like, I want to, I, well I want to, for that. Yeah. I want to, I want to be like the, I want to rank for this. So what if I do this research, like you said, and I find that, you know, there isn't anybody, should I abandon that blog post or should I, should I try to stack it and stuff it into something else? And, you know, maybe about, you know, uh, the best places in, you know, if I wanted to kind of do a travel blog and make the best places, you know, in the Caribbean to do underwater basket. We, what do you do? Like if you, do you just throw it out and your dreams are dashed or what do you tell people who have like, you know, Mike, I did this research. I plugged it in this tool and looked at this and um, there's nobody searching for this. What should I do? Well, let me be honest for a moment. And this is a little bit of a tough love situation. Mm -hmm. It may be that what you want to write about is not going to earn you money. You are not going to get enough traffic to earn sufficient revenue with that particular sphere of, of, of keywords or, or topics that right. you want to write about. And, and we need to be honest about that. And I would say it's much better to learn that today before you've put a couple of years of work <laughs> into creating all that content and then find out or come to the realization that nobody really wants to know about this particular topic. So let's be honest about that. But that said, if you are doing some research and you're finding that you know there just isn't a lot of traffic for the keywords that you're looking for, there are definitely some things you can do. The first thing you can do is pay attention to the other keywords that the, the tool is giving you, like SEMrush. If I put in how to start a blog as a keyword phrase, SEMrush is going to give me a lot of other variations of that phrase, and it will tell me exactly what the numbers are for those variations. So I might find that it's a variation that mm. people are searching for. Like, do I start a blog? Should I start a blog? How to start blogging? Great example there. How to start a blog is not the same keyword phrase as how to start blogging, mm. right? Those are different words. It's a little bit of a subtle difference, but it's different enough that maybe the volume will be different. So watch for that. The second thing you can do is go broader. You don't want to go so broad and just like, in this case, blog. Blog right. as a keyword is, is awful. Um, <laughs> it's, it's so untargeted. Keep, nobody's searching on blog, let alone going to come to you for, or me for blogging advice. But if I broaden it to say, start blogging, two words, now I might be hitting the volume levels I want to be successful. That does require you to take a look at the next column over in whatever tool you're using. The next mm -hmm. column over is going to be the competition. How many other search results, how many other websites are also currently putting out content that is ranking for that particular phrase? Because if it's so competitive, I mean, if there's just millions of results out there and good solid results, and most tools will actually show you what the results are so you can compare. I mean, you might mm -hmm. find that, frankly, it's it's rubbish. It's, it's just garbage. And right. you could rank pretty easily just by putting out some really good content. But if you find, in most respects, that it's good competition, it's good websites, then we got to think about, okay, how long am I willing to wait, right? How much effort am I willing to put into this particular project, this business or blog before I can see success? Mm. So a couple of questions out of what you were saying that I came up. So one, are there any other, you mentioned SEM rest is a tool. Is there any other tools that you would recommend for people who want to do this keyword research? Yeah, actually I would start with Google itself. Hmm. So you can go to Google and there's two things you can do. You can go to google.com and the regular search bar that we're all familiar with. And we've all actually done this and not realized it. If you start typing in right. a word or two, Google will autocomplete right? Google will try to anticipate what is it that you're actually searching for. And it'll actually show you the number of results for each of those autocompletes. So if you start to type in how to start, right. and Google's going to say, you know, a business, a uh, shop, uh, mm -hmm. whatever, you know, but and then if you start typing in how to start blog, and it will finish at, it'll say like how to start a blog in 2021, how to start a blog that makes money. And there's right. all these variations there. Google will tell you what the what the what the results are. So there's that. The other thing you can do is start a free Google ad account. And inside Google's ad account, 
is their keyword planner, which is right. also free. So you don't actually have to run ads. You don't have to give them your credit card or pay anything to use that particular tool. I like SEM Rush because SEM Rush will save the data. But to be perfectly mm. frank, the data is the same. SEM Rush is getting their data out of Google. So you could use the keyword planner for some spot research. And by spot, I mean plug in the, the words, take a look at the numbers, you, and write them down maybe, right. something like that. Because when you go back tomorrow, it's, it's, it's going to be gone. Right. Gotcha. Great tips there, um, especially free. We all like free. Uh, the other yeah. thing I was thinking about is because, um, like in your your – uh, where you blog at the social media hat.com. Um, the keyword is in the domain name. How important is that mm -hmm. for, you know, for your blog? Should you really like, if I'm going to blog about underwater basket weaving, should I really try to find s some way to like, you know, incorporate underwater basket uh, weaving into a dot com or a dot org or whatever kind of domain name I'm trying to get? Absolutely. If okay. you can, if it makes sense for you and for your business. Um, that's one of probably 500 to 1,000 what we call ranking factors. These are mm. individual things that Google looks at. And there's just so many of them. There isn't just one thing that you have to do. And that also means there are things that you could safely ignore. You can be very successful with a blog about a particular topic where the domain name itself has nothing to do with the topic. Mm. Moz.com is a great example right. from the SEO space. Moz is a word that they just made up, right? Right. They just made it up. Uh, mm. Just like Google itself is a made up word. Obviously, you can rank very, very well with the domain. However, it helps. Right. So if you're starting a business, you're starting a blog from scratch today, if at all possible, definitely choose a domain name where the thing that you want to be known for the most is part of or the entirety of that URL. That's hard today mm -hmm. because the internet's been around for a long time. Domains right. have been around for a long time, but it's possible. Would you, this is a side note, would you recommend getting some of these new ones? Like, you know, you can get the social media hat dot live or dot, you know, or is it really should, if you're starting a blog, really concentrate on getting a dot com? Does that make a difference? It doesn't make a difference from an SEO perspective. Um, what it makes a difference in terms of is usage. Mm. Right. So like we've been talking about my domain name, the social right. media hat. You've actually said it a couple of times. You said the social media hat and you said blogging brute. You actually didn't say the extension, which means people are going to assume it's, it's dot, com. dot com. And if you don't, if, it, if that's not what it is, right, if it's in video.io, then you have to say the dot io right. every single time and you have to be OK with that. Yeah, that's so a that, great point. Really a, kind of a judgment call. Yeah, that's a great point. So, um, all right. So we've tackled keywords and keyword research and some tools with that. So let's talk this other thing, other one, because if you've done any anything online, you've probably got ads for these uh, to get and to buy um, backlinks. You know, you know, backlinks are this like secret sauce that everybody wants, and they talk about you need to get it from a edu, and you got to get it from these. What does that mean? And so. First of all, take it uh, broadly from somebody who may not have any idea what uh, uh, backlinks are, and then let's dive into some of those questions uh, that I have later. Yeah, so we're building our own blog. We're building a blog right. about box turtles. We, we bought somehow boxturtles.com was available. If another website at a different domain decides to give us a link, right? So they, they create some text on their site and it's hyperlinked. And if somebody clicks on it, they will go to boxturtles.com. That's referred to as a back link. Mm -hmm. And it's basically a vote of confidence. If I'm going to link to your site from mine, I must like yours or be referring to yours for some good reason. I'm not gonna do it on a whim. I'm not gonna do it for no reason whatsoever. And it's an important part of the web. It's kind of like the basic structure of the web. It's why we call it a web because all these different servers and sites and entities online are interlinking to each other, creating a web of links. So they're really important. The different kinds of sites that can be out there, like you mentioned .edu mm -hmm. and .gov, those are very specific extensions. .edu referring to schools, .gov referring to government, specifically U.S. government. And those are very hard to get. You can't just go out and buy a .edu or right. .gov 
domain extension. You have to be an educational institution. You have to be a government entity. So there's that requirement. And then the very nature of those sites, school websites, college websites aren't in the practice of linking to lots of other right. websites. So a backlink from those entities is really hard to get. So that's why they're valued more, which is what you kind of implied in your right. question. If I could get a backlink from a .edu, that's really amazing, right? Like I've done a lot of work with the University of Missouri, St. Louis, their local mm -hmm. school mm -hmm. with me. And one of the, I, I don't get paid for helping them, but one of the benefits that I got from them was being featured in their blog and a link from umsl.edu to my site. They just did it to be nice, but I saw that and I was like, yes, because right. that link is yeah. worth a lot of money right. when it comes to an SEO valuation. So to get that link was fantastic. And that's definitely the kind of thing that I would recommend businesses look for opportunities. Now, can you buy links? Yes. Should you? Probably not. Because the kind of sites that are going to sell links are probably not the sites that are going to give you actual value. Mm -hmm. If they're selling links themselves, they're probably selling a lot of links and they're devaluing valuing their own domain. If, the, if Google sees that you're just linking to lots and lots of websites with your own site, Google's going to be like, mm, what's going on over there? Why aren't you focusing on talking about your topic? Or if you find a service that promises to get you backlinks right. from a lots of other websites, again, they're going after sites that are willing to sell the links and right. resell them. And, and that's not a good thing. What you want to do are, first of all, create great content. Right. That should always be your number one focus. Create great content and let other people link to you organically and naturally. And secondly, there are ways that you could go after specific backlinks, either by guest posting or by asking. Mm. So does it run the other way? Because if you do any sort of blogging for any amount of time, you're going to get requests from people saying, hey, I want a guest post for your blog. All I want is a backlink. So how important it is, is it for you as a maybe a new blogger to really not just give links out to people willy nilly or people who say, hey, I'll write for you as long as you link back to this or because I know you get them probably right now you probably got 20 in your inbox but um yeah what do you what does it work the other way does it flow does the i guess the google juice flow the other way as well yeah we actually refer to it as juice we actually refer to it as seo juice and it will flow both ways you actually do want to have some external links from your site google doesn't want to see a website domain name boxturtles.com where you never link to anybody else. And that's just not possible. If you want to do any kind of affiliate revenue or anything like that, you're going to have to have some external links. And so if you can mix in revenue building links, like links that go to amazon.com or, or, you know, Petco or whatever other services you might recommend mm -hmm. along with referential links. In other words, citations, it's not just me telling you that box turtles love alfalfa. I can link to a New England Journal of Medicine survey that says box turtles <laughs> like alfalfa. I obviously just made that up. But <laughs> those kinds of good referential citations are great. And if you have a guest blogger who's willing to create some content for you for free, where you know they're going to share with you some information about your target topic, box turtles, and they're going to link to maybe a blog post of their own. That's actually pretty good. And that is one of the requirements that I make. I don't usually accept uh, guest bloggers. But mm -hmm. when I do, I say, look, within the content, you can have external links. And you can even link to your own domain name. But it's got a link to an article that you're referencing in you know in context right. right if somebody's on my site and they're talking about email marketing and they're talking about how it's okay to use templates they can link back to an article or a survey they've done or a study they've done that talks about email templates i think that's great they can't just link to email template.com where they're selling email templates because then that's really an e-commerce salesy right. link it's not a citation that helps valid validate uh the content that's being shared so Backlinks are important both ways. The juice going both ways. So let's say you're starting a new blog or you're, you've let your blog lay dormant for a while. How do you go about building 
good backlinks? What is there a strategy involved? Do you just email all your friends on your email list and say, hey, link to my site? How do you build up those backlinks to uh, give your your blog more of that SEO juice? The best way, and when I say best, I mean it's the most successful in terms of uh, like conversion, and it's probably going to give you the best links, is to find places where you can write for them. Do basically what we were just talking about, only you're the one doing the writing instead of you're the one accepting the writing. So if you're doing the guest posting, you can go after other sites in your general domain space that are writing about similar topics and you can give them content for free as long as they link back to you. Right. Um, those could be other bloggers in your space. Those are probably going to be the easiest targets. Uh, more difficult would be publications like entrepreneur.com, inc.com, forbes.com. Mm -hmm. Those kinds of publications are really hard to get into. I don't even recommend trying uh, mm -hmm. at, at this point unless you know somebody. If you've got an in, well, then that's great. But if you don't, uh, do some research. Your SEM rush told you who's already ranking mm -hmm. uh, for your, your keyword phrases. That's your first target, right? If I'm doing a keyword research on how to start a blog, one of the first domain names that's going to come up is Darren Rouse yeah. with his problogger.com. So if I want to rank well for blogging, I'm going to guest post for Darren. I'm going to approach Darren and say, hey, Darren, I, I've got a topic. If I really want to be super successful at this, I'm going to write the article first. I'm not going to ask for permission. Mm, I'm going to write great. the article first and I'm going to give it to him. And it's going to be a well-researched article that I know, number one, he hasn't covered. And number two, I talk about his content in my article and I link to his content in my article. Now, if I'm doing this well, I'm going to do it in a way that I could just, just between us, right? Yeah. Yeah. I could link to other people. So if Darren says no, I could go to somebody else and change those links, right? Mm. That's, that's, that's a smart way to do it. Uh, Cause Darren may say no, or he right. may ignore me. And then I might have to go on to Jeff Bullis or somebody else like that and say, Hey Jeff, here's an article that I wrote just for you. And, right. and I've switched out the links, right? But <laughs> right. make sure you do that. Um, but the point is that you're going to pitch this article uh, and you'll probably have to pitch it two, three, four, maybe, maybe more times, particularly if you're new to the industry. If you are cold emailing these guys, which I don't recommend you do, connect with them on social media first. That's the beauty of social networking. It's free and it's easy. You can look up the people that are currently creating content in your space and you can follow them on Twitter and you can engage with them on Twitter and you can do that for a few weeks before you reach out with an ask. That's important. But yes, yeah, that's what I would do is create that content first. So this is, that's, this is, you know, mic drop. This is it right here. The, the whole thing. We can go home after this. Um, I think this is super important for people who are reaching out. One, you know, you have to have it. You don't want to give them this example article like you're talking about with typos in it. This needs to be your best work. Oh, yeah. And yeah. this is how I think Mike and I connected actually. And how I started my business was that I went and it was back, we talked about this earlier, Google Plus, where I was, I would make thoughtful comments uh, on somebody's piece of content or a blog post they would go. And then that gets them noticed. And then they share your stuff. And I think I've even written for you before, Mike, on your on social media, yep. social media hat. So that's how things happen. But I think that, you know, for getting started and getting these backlinks, which you're talking about how important they are, is just genius the way Mike just laid it out, the way you should be doing that, trying to get those backlinks. One question I have, Mike, is so I know your strategy has changed from when you started blogging to what you're doing now. What are your what are your tips for like like what somebody on your level who blogs all the time? Do you can do you still try to build up those backlinks, or are you like I'm done? I'm sitting back on my laurels and just let them all come to me. I'm ranking on Google. What what is your strategy now? Yeah, I'm a terrible example uh, because <laughs> my own blogs are side passion projects, right? right. I work full-time for Agora Pulse. That is my full-time job. I could go three months without posting a blog post to the social media hat, and I'm okay with that. If you're listening, you're not in my shoes. You're not working full-time for business, and these are side projects that you don't care about. So for everybody listening, don't do what I do. <laughs> you definitely want to keep working on backlinks. You definitely want to keep creating great content. You don't have to blog daily or weekly as long as you have a schedule and you, you stick to it. And that's mostly for your own personal 
accomplishments, right? right? Your, most blogging audiences, they're, they're not really looking for your next blog post because your blog content is based on search results. And so the, the schedule is to make sure you personally keep at it. And if you do that, then you will regularly create opportunities for yourself to earn new, fresh backlinks. And the reason you want to do that is because your competition, whoever they are, they're not stopping. Mm, they're still creating point. more content. They're generating more backlinks. And if you want to stay ahead or keep up or catch, you're going to need to create content and market yourself and promote your content accordingly. That's great. That's a great point. So before we go into the diving into the content of the blog, because I know you have a bunch of tips there. Um, let's talk about like, just like the, the on-site experience, because blogging has changed mm -hmm. from back in the day where it was just like a, a notepad and you read other people's notepads. I mean, it's now it's, um, you got pop-ups, you can get AdSense on your site, you know, and things can pop up on your screen. How important is the experience and like even load times? What should people really think about optimizing, you know, the, the main thing they need to worry about when they're creating that blog. Like, and I know, you know, mobile experience versus, you know, desktop, all that stuff. What, what is the most important in your opinion? Hmm. Well, the most important I think is going to be the title of your post and then the first sentence and each successive sentence after that, because the title of your post is what's going to get somebody to decide to read mm -hmm. your content. It's going to get them to decide to read that first sentence. And it's the first sentence that's going to keep them reading into the next sentence and the sentence after that. So there are a lot of things that you just talked about that are, they're all very, very important, but the most important would be the, that attention grabbing title and how it leads them into the first sentence and captures that attention and leads them through the rest of your content. Now you mentioned things like load time, mm -hmm. right? And, and having pictures that's critical for two reasons. You've got on the one hand, the user itself himself or herself who is going to come to your site, probably on their phone, right. probably through a mobile search. And they're going to expect that your site is there for them to start reading within seconds. They're not gonna wait 30, 60 seconds. They're gonna hit the back button and go back out. So it's important for that perspective, but Google's also paying very close attention to that. Page speed has become one of the most important search engine ranking factors. We talked about ranking factors. One of the most important ones because they know what users want. Right. Google's just trying to give users what users want. So if Google sees that your page is not loading fast, that your blog posts are not loading fast, it's not going to rank you well because Google knows people aren't going to wait. Google knows people are just going to hit the back button and go on to the next search result. So definitely focus on page speed after the writing is done. Mm, that's a great point. Yeah, because if page, even if it's a like couple of milliseconds slower, if you don't have a clear way that people are, are seeing what this blog is about, uh, about they're going to bounce uh, because they know they can go back and hit that next search result on Google right underneath the one that you, you came up with. So I think that's a great point. Um, before we go more deep, even than we have been with Mike. We're gonna. I want to make sure you guys know that this is going to be a podcast. And if you would like to be signed up for when it goes live, the beginning of next month, make sure you go to bit.ly forward slash IV podcast. That's bit.ly forward slash IV podcast. And that will uh, get you on the list. So when we do launch, you will get the whole catalog of all these awesome uh, shows that we are doing. So um, let's talk about perfecting your blog content because we've talked to kind of around it and kind of some of the technical aspects, but one of the reasons that you're so successful, I believe is because you write good content. It's, it's, it tells a story. It's not just doing facts. I mean, if you check out Mike's stuff in his newsletter uh, this past week was a perfect example of this is he weaves history and story into his blog post. He's not just talking about like, da, 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 da. here's a, a listicle that I'm just throwing up there. Um, so, you know, in your about section, you said it it takes you about an hour to write a 2,000 word piece of content that gets seen everywhere. Um, and so in Video Guys, they did some research and they um, did some trying to see of like, what does it take to, you know, write a blog in 2021? And the first result in Google was the blogging brute. It came up. That was you when they searched that. So 
how did did you did you go through all the things we talked about before? Did you do the keyword research and knew that would work? Um, how did you identify, you know, first of all, those keywords and and kind of your steps to get that to rank number one? Because that that's a pretty good. I mean, a lot of people are trying to get that right now. I mean, that is a very competitive spot, and you made it. Yeah. So the first thing I do is I have an idea for what it is that I want to write about. Mm-hmm. Even more specifically, when it comes to to business results, I will have an idea of what I want to accomplish for the business. And this is a great example because sometimes I'll write because I just want to write about a particular topic. Like right. this weekend, I wrote about Martin Luther King Jr. and some lessons to draw from him because of the timing and everything right. like that. There wasn't necessarily a business result in mind for that. So there was no keyword research there. But I have products that help people create blogs. I have products that help people create really, really good content for their business. So when I want to rank for that, I am naturally doing some keyword research. And one of the keyword phrases that it was probably SEM Rush delivered up to me was how to start a blog in 2019. I think that was the first time I researched right. that particular topic because I was looking for how to start a blog, how to start blogging, that sort of thing. And SEM Rush said, oh, but if you tack the year on to the end, there's a lot mm. of people looking for that. I thought, oh, okay, that's interesting. Because I have a really, really substantial piece of content about how to start a blog. And I really go into depth about, you know, the platform you want to use, like uh, WordPress, how to pick a domain name, what all this keyword research means. I mean, it's, I think, 10 to 15,000 words. It's a massive piece of content. Not every blog post I write is that long. Mm -hmm. So I wrote how to start a blog in 2019, and then I updated it for 2020. I will do the same thing this year for 2021 because I want to rank for those phrases. And the content itself is very high level. I don't want to say superficial, but it's it, you could almost use that phrase superficial because I want it to be, first of all, what I know. And we're going to talk about that in just a second. And I want it to be a quick read. I want to give somebody the basics of what they're looking for. Should I start a blog this year or not? That shouldn't be a treatise. It shouldn't be a whole book that you got to read just to decide if you want to start a blog this year. It should be a fairly simple you know, set of questions I should ask myself is this a good time? Do I have the time? Is right. this a topic I want to write about? Um, you know, there's some other factors that could go into that. So I started thinking about that and I realized I have all that information in my head. And I think that's a really important consideration for businesses and bloggers. Not every article that you write should be a research paper. Hmm. Not every article that you write should take you eight to 10 hours of going to Google and, and looking to see who else has written it. And, uh, you know, how do I do that particular thing? Because nine times out of 10, what people want to learn is what you already had to share. It's the information like, like this, this cause is, is a great example. I didn't prepare really. Right. We had some conversation, right? Right. But I didn't spend the weekend studying up for this, interview. And this interview is going to result in about an hour's worth of content, which if you break that down, if you were to just publish it as a blog post, that's like 10,000 words right there. Now you could distill it and turn it from an interview perspective into a just a tutorial right. and break it down to about 2,000 words. So if I could speak a 2,000 word blog post without any prep or organization, I'm just drawing on my year's of experience. That's the kind of content that you should be creating most of the time. Most business owners should really just be finding questions that they can answer themselves and then answer them. Mm. Someone that we know really well wrote a book. They ask, you answer. That's Marcus Sheridan. Right. And then a lot of people like Stephanie will talk about a, a 10 by 10 format where you'll come up with a list of the 10 frequently asked questions in your business and answer them. And then you'll come up with the 10 questions that people should be asking, but maybe Mm. don't. And you answer those. That's 20 blog posts or live videos or podcast episodes, whatever you format you want to use. It doesn't really matter as long as you're answering the questions. And if you go into Google or you go into SEM rush and you plug in some of those questions, you look at the search results, that'll help you prioritize. You may still want to answer some of those questions, even if they don't necessarily get good search volume because, you know, your questions are answering or it's that should ask thing. Sometimes I will create content that I know 
people are not searching on. And yet it comes up in conversation. If you love baseball, I call this a purpose pitch. So if you like baseball, sometimes pitchers will throw a ball on, and I don't mean just you know, the baseball. I mean, they right. will not throw a strike on purpose, right? The, the purpose of a baseball uh, game is to get three strikes and then the batter is out, right? For those who really maybe don't, who are listening right. or don't know right. how to play baseball. Right. So you get three strikes or four balls on, on the batter as the pitcher. Well, if you throw a ball that's high and tight, meaning it's like up near their head, the, the umpire is not going to call that a strike and you're kind of th- wasting a pitch, except it gets the batter to step back from the batter's box and it makes the outside corner a little mm. harder for them to reach with their bat. And so a smart pitcher will throw a baseball that's high and tight and then the next one's low and away and they're going to swing at it and they're going to miss nine times out of ten. They're setting them up and it's a purpose pitch. Now, you don't want to hit the batter because that sends them to first base. Right. So you got to be careful with that purple right, pitch. Right. But that means you know sometimes you can write content that isn't going to rank well, and you know it, as long as you're setting things up for the future. Like I wrote a piece called Forward Linking. You've never heard of forward linking. No one's ever heard of forward linking. I made it up. But it was a concept that I wanted to be able to teach people on. So I had to write the post first and then be able to refer back to it Later, we talked a lot about backlinking in this particular call already. One of the things I talk about in in a lot of my workshops is the need to interlink your content. Like if I'm writing about box turtles and I want to create a body of work about box turtles and help people really understand it, I might write five, six, or seven articles and I might want them to link together. Mm. Right? I want I might want people to be able to consume all of those articles, but If I'm only backlinking internally, that means the latest article is only linking to the article that I wrote last week and then the article that I wrote the week before. I need to actually go back to the first few articles that I wrote and link forward to the most recent articles. So that way people can bounce back and forth and follow along and learn how to feed, how to care for, how to clean, you know, all these different things about that particular topic. So... Because you just gave a, a great little thing about strategy there, you mentioned that you have like three or four or five blog articles that would kind of interlink to this main point you're trying to get a, get a, uh, across. So my question is, is are you always writing, and you're not writing just to the next week's blog post. You have a almost mm-hmm. a database of stuff. And I think you, if I remember right, you use Evernote to keep all that stuff together. But... Um, and you have told me from past conversations, like you have stuff that you, you don't always write one article all at once. You could have like, I'm going to work on this piece. Like you may have uh, worked on that Martin Luther King article, um, months ago, all right. And kind of added to it, then polished it up and then published it. So how important it is, is it for bloggers and talk about like the strategy of like, of always creating content or always capturing content and doing ideas. Cause I think you just alluded to a little bit. I don't want to let this go by because I think this is an important piece. And part of the reason you're so prolific in your blogging is because you do use this method. Yeah. Thanks for teeing that up because there's, there's two very important topics here. The first is always capture those ideas when you have them. I do use Evernote still to this day, like you said, because Mm -hmm. I've got it on my iPhone, I've got it on my laptop, I've got it on my iPad, so no matter where I'm at, I I think it's even on my watch. Uh, If an idea comes to me for a piece of content, I can record it. And you mentioned um, a recent episode, the Martin Luther King isn't a good example, but um, a week or two ago, I wrote about Voyager. And I wrote about the legacy that Voyager has created for us as a people and specifically, um, you know, Chuck Berry, because the Voyager space capsules that were launched in the 70s had these golden discs Mm -hmm. on them. And Chuck Berry's Johnny B. Good is on a golden record. Right, right, right. Aliens a billion years ago may play and hear his music. I mean, our planet will be gone, but Johnny B. Good will live on, which is kind of pretty cool, right? That idea for that blog post literally is seven years old. (laughs) Right, right. My daughter and I were walking through Del Mar, which is an area of St. Louis, and Chuck Berry is from St. Louis. And we have our own kind of Hollywood star of fame, right? So there's stars for famous St. Louisans 
on Del Mar Avenue. And Chuck Berry not only has a star, he actually has a mural on the side of a record store. And my daughter was, I think, two years old at the time. Uh, and we saw that star. And I told her this story about Voyager and about how I'd seen it and everything. And there's, there's a whole thing there. So the point is, I had this idea two, seven years ago. And I threw it in Evernote and never really got around to pulling it apart and unpacking it and actually writing it. And I decided a, you know, a week or two ago, now's the time. I want to talk about legacy this week, and I'm going to use this story. Same example was like three weeks ago, I talked about Twitter search and how you can do all these amazing things with Twitter right. search. Again, that was an article that I started four years ago when I was taking my daughter out for ribs. It doesn't really matter why. Right. The point right. is I had Evernote and the idea came to me and I put it in there and it just waits until I'm ready to write about it. Now, the second thing you brought up was structure, and this is mm -hmm. critical, and I don't even know if we've got time today to really break it apart, but we talked about juice. We talked about SEO juice right? and this idea that other sites, if they link to us and vice versa, we can pass this SEO juice back and forth. Well, SEO juice exists internally as well, which is why I mentioned it's so important that you have links within your articles to other articles that you have written that are about the same thing, whether it's directly related, like if that's the actual next thing that they need to read, or it's just kind of marginally related, it doesn't really matter as long as there are links there. I like having structure when I want to rank for something really, really important. Like if I want to rank for how to start a blog, it's a great example. That means that particular piece is the most important article on my site. And mm -hmm. I want other pieces of content below it that are going to link up. And they're going to create SEO juice that links up and supports and makes that pinnacle piece of content rank. I call this a content pyramid. I like the idea of pyramids and, right, right. and, and, and triangles, right? So how to start a blog is at the top of my content pyramid. And for most businesses that are doing this, that thing at the top, should lead to a business result. Like in my case, if you go into how to start a blog and you're really into it, you're either going to buy hosting from me, you're going to start, you're going to buy a planner from me, you might even buy some training from me. So this is going to lead to actual revenue for me, this particular piece of content. So I decided, okay, I'm going to come up with three subtopics that I'm going to layer below that. And these are going to be three major pieces of content. So I'm going to talk about WordPress. I'm going to talk about hosting. And I'm going to talk about blogging as a, like how to do it. And then with the, within those things or underneath those things, if you're visual, I'm creating blog content. So like under WordPress, I created nine pieces of content that really unpack different aspects of WordPress plugins, themes, um, other things. I don't remember a right, bunch right. of stuff. Right, right? right. So I wrote all that. I wrote all those pieces of content and they all rank, they all link up to a core piece about WordPress, which then links into how to start a blog. So in a really quick nutshell, that's how I structure content that I want to rank for. Now, not every blog post fits into a content pyramid. You can have multiple content pyramids. It doesn't have to be one thing at the top with three things underneath it and then three blog posts underneath. That's just a convenient way to structure it. You could have two subtopics and six blog posts for each subtopic. doesn't matter. You could have four subtopics. The mm. point is that you have an idea in your brain and you write it down. This is what I want to rank for, this particular thing at the top. This leads to a business result that's important to me. And so I'm going to break that down into some subtopics, some subpages, and some blog posts. And I'm going to create that over time. Because this takes time. Right. This isn't something you're going to do overnight. And it should take time. It should be really well thought, well researched, well structured pieces of content. Other uh, SEO experts will call these skyscrapers or right. Right. Uh, silo pieces. You'll see these kinds of phrases interchangeably. Like I said, I like the pyramid. I like the visualization of creating multiple layers and, and allowing all of that to structure up and link up into something that's going to rank really, really well. That's awesome. So yeah, yeah. So, so many ideas swirling around my head. We are going to have to have you back on uh, with NVIDIA and talk, and talk about this some more. But I want to wrap it up with this kind of going back to where we started and get your thoughts on this because a lot of people say, well, blogging's dead. You need, no one's reading. You need to do video. That's all you need to do. So is it too late to start blogging in 2021? Absolutely not. 
I do agree with the societal perception that everything is video because that's what's top of mind right now. TikToks are a great example. Right. I like TikTok. I'm not a TikTok creator, but I love going to TikTok and being fed funny <laughs> videos. I, right. Again, I even right. wrote about that in a, in a previous uh, marketing hyperdrive, how to be TikTok for your customers. But the thing is, TikTok is not long form content. TikTok is not teaching me. TikTok is not searchable in the sense that I'm going to Google and searching how to make paella and finding right. a 60 second TikTok that's teaching me. Right. Good point. That's not happening today. If I'm doing a Google search on how to make paella, I'm finding what? A long form blog mm -hmm. post. Now, recipe bloggers, they're a little too long form. They kind of go a little crazy. <laughs> well, they have but, video too. So they use both. I know you feel me on that, yeah. <laughs> but the, but it's it's still written content, right? If you want to find out how to be successful with content marketing, you're not landing on short form video. You're landing on long form. Now it could be long form video or long form written content. I'm okay with that. I'm okay with long form videos if they're teaching me something of, of value. I'm I'm not opposed to that conceptually because I get not everybody learns the same way. Some right. people want to be shown. Some people want to read. I actually prefer to read. I prefer to not have to listen to something, usually because I'm not in a situation where I want to hear something. I want to have the volume off, and I want to be able right. to just read at my own time. But blogging, yeah, creating written content, 100%. Definitely start today. Awesome. Well, Mike, thank you once again. I mean, I've known you forever, but I get so much value every time we talk. Um, thank you for letting us pick your brain this session and for sh sharing everything that you, you know, you have, but uh, I want to let you, if you, you maybe joined us in the middle of this, but uh, where can people find out more about you, your services, what you do, and even some of your blogs? Yeah, the best place to find me is Blogging Brute. I'm Blogging Brute everywhere, bloggingbrute.com. That's my real personal passion where I get to write about blogging. So that's that's where I like to send people. Awesome. And don't forget his podcast. If you like to listen to things like I do, make sure you go to the socialmediahat.com forward slash marketing dash hyperdrive, socialmediahat.com forward slash marketing dash hyperdrive. Check that out. Sign up for his newsletter. I'm telling you, there's not many news, even newsletters that I read, but Mike is one that I never forget. I even got a little special thing that puts it in a special folder for me to read. So make sure you guys go check that out as well. But as always, uh, if you guys want to know, once again, this is going to be a podcast as well. If you want to know more about that, sign up to get notifications. Go to bit.ly forward slash IV podcast and you will get notified there and as always we love for you guys to share this out among all your friends on the socials if you thought this was a valuable conversation at mention them down below call them in uh, we would love to be able to share this podcast and this live show with them as well so thank you so much mike you're awesome we'll talk to you next time bye and the podcast machine is off. I want to say really quick before we end the live, uh, thank you. Uh, oh, Deb. Awesome, Deb. Thank you for putting that on the screen. Deb. Deb is always awesome. Thanks, Deb. And, of course, our friend Stephanie showed up today. Thanks, Stephanie, for sh uh, coming here. And then Scott, of course, Mike is blogging with his feet. So <laughs> thank you. Thanks, Mike, for it. He is. You can't see it. We cut it off because it's just not something you want to see live. But uh, wants to see my toes. That's right. There's probably a channel for that, though, if you really search the webs. Um, <laughs> but thank you so much, everybody, for watching and sticking uh, with us and asking some great questions. And uh, like I said, Mike is uh, just an incredible blogger, and make sure you check out all his stuff. Good friend of mine. He has taught me uh, pretty much everything I know. I don't know if that's a good thing or not, but uh, he has taught me a lot <laughs> about the socials, starting back at Google+. Plus. So with that, we'll see. Uh, say bye now. We'll see you next time, everybody. Thanks for watching.